Hey YouTube, Warbles on a lot here with the Mad Scientist movie. One where I get to say, as it was foretold within the prophecy. Because 13 years ago I went into print prophesying as a mad scientist, predicting as a low speed aerodynamics consultant that somewhere, somebody, sometime would have another go at steam rockets. Because water is really good at storing energy if you store it there as heat. Give you some idea of how much energy you can store in water and release again as heat. Think of it this way. There's about a pound, for my imperial thinking viewers, about a pound or a bit less than half a kilo, a pound of water in a teacup. If you want to raise the temperature of a pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. It takes as much energy as it does in a one earth gravity field of 32 feet per second per second to raise that pound 768 feet vertically into the sky. That's why nobody ever builds a tall tower in their backyard to put a water tank on top so their windmill can pump water into the tower to run back down through a Pelton wheel and drive an alternator to charge their batteries. It's just not worth doing because you'd need to have a tower a couple of thousand feet high before it's worth doing. At least 500 feet. Right, so water rockets. They work by having water as a reaction mass and compressed air to blow the water out through a nozzle. Steam rockets they work by containing an amount of water and then heating it past the point of boiling until it's as hot as the container can possibly stand without bursting and then taking the pressure off the superheated liquid water inside the containment vessel. And back in August 2001 I was regularly having articles published in the ultralight aviation press because back then I'd been fairly recently revealed as something like the granddaddy Santa Claus of the ultralight fraternity because the aeroplane that I made my first solo in survived the experience and so did I and then my father sold it to another bloke in the next town down the road while I was off in the big city and he never flew it so it survived his ownership and now it hangs in the transport museum and it's pretty ancient and pretty rare and pretty primitive. In fact, it can claim to be the first legal minimum aircraft in the world because it was made specifically to demonstrate a lawnmower engine on a hang glider airframe to the Australian Department of Transport Air Safety Branch in January 1976 and Air Navigation Order 95.10 was gazetted in Australia later on that same year. So, when the last person to fly the world's first legal minimum aircraft sent them a letter on steam rockets, Pacific Flyer were happy to publish. A bit of trivia by Chris Wharton. This is an amazing little lump of trivia which is far from useless. Historically speaking, the steam rocket was developed to loft rescue ropes from shore to shipwrecks. A finned steel canister of water with a threaded lead plug up the rocket nozzle and a wire tow bridle. Set it pointed towards the imperiled ship. It was built like an old-fashioned skyrocket. The steel container was at one end of a long stick, only the stick was a steel rod. You poke the steel rod into the sand and that holds the canister of water over the top of where you light the fire. Set it pointed towards the imperiled ship and light a hot fire under the rocket. Stoke from the side because when the lead melts then the water transforms to superheated steam which blows the fire all over the beach during liftoff with molten droplets of lead at the wave front. I think it was the early versions of the jet development of the Percival Provost which used the idea as a takeoff assist. It was a water tank connected to a heat exchanger wrapped around the jet pipe and a nozzle pointed backwards 
and it worked. But engines evolved to achieve the same effect a different way. On takeoff power settings, a Boeing 707 like the Raffi Chappies still play with drinks 45,000 pounds per hour of kerosene. Simultaneously though, there's another 156,000 pounds per hour of water being pumped into the burner cans. Where the water becomes superheated steam, which maintains the chamber pressure while soaking up the heat to a point where the turbine blades don't melt. Three times the water for every pound of kerosene. Therefore, it's more like an atmospheric steam rocket than it is a pure turbojet. Only while the water injection is running on takeoff for maximum thrust. But it's true. They've got a kerosene fire to boil the water in an atmospheric steam rocket. And the article concludes, then, of course, anybody with a welder and some sheet steel and a pipe could knock up a five-gallon rocket with a clamped plug up the nozzle, rather than relying on lead to melt at the calculated instant. And with an LPG burner or two off a hot air balloon, 5,000 horsepower of raw heat per coil, I understand, and knowledge of orbital tracks, you could at least send greetings to the International Space Station and maybe even test the construct's ability to dodge. All for less than a thousand dollars per try. It's only rocket science. Cool. So I got away with having that published under my name in 2001. And to my knowledge, nobody has yet tried it. Not sending greetings to the International Space Station with a five gallon steam rocket made up out of welded sheet steel. But it could be done. However, in the current issue of Air and Space Smithsonian, to wit, May 2014, on page 12, above a picture of Brian Allen, who won the Kremer Prize twice, once for pedalling a one mile figure eight in a human powered aircraft and once for flying the English Channel in a human powered aircraft and in 1986 was on the cover of Air and Space Smithsonian in a pedal powered dirigible hot air balloon dirigible means steerable we have extreme rockets and the photograph shows a machine with a very short fuselage three tail fins which have cutouts in them, very artistic, but you know, it reduces the surface area, and uh, it's actually got a cabin at the front end. The photograph's taken from a very strange angle. If I turn the side frame of my camera to be parallel to the vertical supports on the tower, we can see that as the caption says, the launch rail for Mad Mike's steam rocket is angled at an alarming 52 degrees. And we have a teaser showing a visually apparently successful takeoff. So here's what the article says. Extreme rockets. Last January, quote, Mad Mike Hughes strapped into a home-built rocket, pulled the cork on a superheated water motor that produces 4,000 pounds of thrust, and rode a ramp pointed almost straight up into the Arizona sky. The goal was the world's longest vehicle jump. Hughes, who built the rocket himself, expected to hit 350 miles per hour and an altitude of 3,500 feet before landing by parachute a quarter of a mile from the launch site. In 2002, Michael Hughes, 57, an ex-motorcycle racer who bills himself as, quote, the world's most famous limo driver, accelerated a Lincoln Town Car stretch limousine up a ramp and travelled 103 feet at a California speedway, claiming a Guinness World Record. For the past six years, he's been working on a rocket inspired by Evil Knievel's 1974 attempt to jump Idaho's Snake River Canyon on a steam-powered rocket. On January 30, at a remote site in Winkleman, Arizona, Hughes heated water overnight until the pressure in the stainless steel tank reached 420 pounds per square inch. Must have had an electric immersion heater inside there. 
420 psi is 29 atmospheres by the way as soon as the generators were shut off he heard steam hissing from what he presumed was a leak we'll get back to that later fearing that the rocket might explode he jumped into the cockpit of the X2 Sky Limo and blasted off the 60 foot ramp before properly tightening the seat belts. The launch was so violent that Hughes became disoriented. Unexpectedly, the rocket flew parallel to the ground at an altitude of about 500 feet. That will be because the fuselage was entirely too short and the tail fins were entirely too small. And then he cut holes in the things for the artistic look of the thing. Apparently he didn't spend much time studying aeroballistic projectile design. But when he looked out of the window, obviously if it was travelling parallel to the ground at 500 feet, one side of it must have been showing only the ground in his window so he looked up and saw nothing but the earth and decided somehow that he was pointing straight down so he immediately released the ballistic parachute which started to shred because the rocket was going too fast so he's fired his ballistic parachute while he was still under steam power the sky limo crash landed nose down a few degrees past vertical it was totaled but Hughes survived with severe bruising of the ribs and groin from the seat belts. So he's obviously got the belts around him and he's got them connected, but he hasn't had time to adjust the harness. One would have thought that the belts would be very, very close to being at the correct length before he started heating the water. Like if I was going to try and fly a crazy ass contraption like that, I would at least have pre-adjusted the seat belts before I started warming up the motor. The 11 second flight covered 1,374 feet. It's about 129 feet per second which is 85 miles per hour. He was hoping for 350 miles an hour and three and a half thousand feet. But I admit that's 85 miles an hour average from a standing start so he probably got going somewhere around 150, 180 miles an hour at its fastest. Probably that was what he was doing when he hit the parachute. The 11 second flight covered 1,374 feet, which he hopes to have certified as a world record by Guinness. Well, as long as he had the correct observers present, they will recognize it as a record. Um, I think they should probably give him his certificate from Guinness and take him to the local psychiatric hospital and, and have him certified another way too. Hughes said later he thought he had a good chance of dying. Oh, why would that be? Why would that be? Hughes says he plans another jump on Memorial Day or on the 4th of July. Sky rockets in flight. Afternoon delight. Madman Mike Hunt. Allowing me to say, behold, as it was foretold, within the prophecy, it's known that the technology exists, therefore some idiot will obviously have a go. Now, let's kind of deconstruct this thing working backwards. He pulled his parachute at 500 feet and somewhere between 150 and 200 miles an hour when he was travelling parallel to the earth. If he'd waited for the rocket to run out of steam, it would have commenced to get lower. And 500 feet's awfully low to be opening a parachute. If he had have waited for it to slow down from what may have built up to a speed of 250 miles an hour, perhaps even he's 300. If he was doing 300 mile an hour, 500 feet off the ground, the rocket shuts off, he's then going to drop at 32 feet per second per second because he didn't have any controls. He, he had no way of aerodynamically converting that speed into height. He was on a trajectory downwards 
I think if he'd waited another two or three seconds, he would have been going faster, he would have been possibly lower, his parachute would have been ripped entirely off the rocket, and he would have dug his own grave instead of just busting his rocket and hurting his groin and his ribs on his loose seat belt. Uh, well, I've already mentioned that he should have pre-adjusted the seat belts or maybe even had a, an inertial lock roller reel so it didn't require personal adjustment each time. But then we get to the idea that when he heard hissing when he turned the steam generator off, I'm assuming again that there was an electric heating element inside the stainless steel water tank and he could hear hissing. If you're going to mess around with mad scientist shit, you've really got to know your equipment. Now if you're dealing with a pressure vessel and it's got a valve on it and you can hear hissing, there is no way that the hissing is going to be coming from the vessel itself. It may be coming from the join between the vessel and the valve, or it may be coming from the valve. But if his pressure vessel had sprung a leak, the entire vessel would have ruptured. Right? That's just the mechanics of it. If you can hear hissing from a vessel that's got pressure in it, the hissing is coming from the valve. I would wager, speaking as somebody who's not entirely unacquainted with mad scientist equipment and the multiple ways that it can find to partially fail but still be doing its job while hanging in there regardless. And as I just happen to know where I can lay my hands on a Challenger brand that is what the name plate says. Challenger brand of kerosene powered water heater. With which I can demonstrate what I think has happened to the poor silly bugger. There we go. What you've got is one cylinder inside another cylinder and the inner cylinder is hollow. <clears throat> and there's supposed to be grease between the inner and the outer cylinder. And it's the grease that forms the actual seal to stop your hot water or your steam from escaping between the two cylinders. Now what's happened to Mad Mike Hunt is that overnight while he's been heating up his tank of water, the grease has dried out. And that's where the steam was escaping, through his rotary block valve, which was his equivalent of a throttle. At least, that's my guess. So the long and the short of it, the easiest way, the politest way to put it, is he didn't know what he was doing. Then he panicked, and he's really lucky to be alive. The worry is that he could get so far down the wrong track with so many things going wrong and have such a little idea of what he was trying to do. And I suspect he's now used up all of his free hits on the cosmic scoreboard. And unless he makes some really, really big changes in his design and in his attitude, the next time he sits in that thing when it's got a head of steam and fires it up into the sky, He's going to win himself a Darwin Award. Although at 57, maybe he's not eligible for a full Darwin Award because he's past his best childbearing years. Anyway, as it was foretold within the prophecy, behold, steam rockets. Steam rockets. Oh, and by the way, you can forget about dodging a steam rocket if you're in the International Space Station. It can't shift its course to the left or to the right. All it can do is fire its thrusters, increase its speed and move to a higher orbit. So, time will tell. It's only rocket science. Orbital's on a lot to YouTube. 
Ciao.